So prediction has been around for a long time and a lot of companies and I would say many people in, on the planet can do prediction pretty well. But causal inference, I'd say, is notoriously difficult, but it's also incredibly important. In the House of AI, in, in sort of the book that we've written, we have emphasized that the next generation of companies, I'd say you comfortably that the battle between 2023 and 2030, the next five to seven years, those companies who invest in people who understand causal inference are going to take that cake. I'm going to talk about, is AI necessarily all that bad? There's a lot of fear mongering about AI. I'm sure you've heard about this. And I want to present to you some evidence, evidence that we think is quite compelling, that hopefully will change your mind that we need to have a lot more of a balanced perspective on this issue. So why I say this is because you, know, you, may, you open any mainstream media, you open a newspaper, a magazine, a television, right? Pretty much all the headlines about AI are about the idea that we should all be afraid of it, right? Um, you know, you're going to hear talks like AI is discriminatory, it is biased, it is unfair, it's unethical, it's going to take our jobs away. Um, some of that may be true, but I'm going to paint the other side of the story, which is to say that there is tremendous you know, positive effect that AI is causing on various aspects of our business and society, in particular issues such as mental health, physical health, relationships, work, career, financial literacy, education. Okay? For each of these seven areas, we actually now have scientific evidence that AI is actually making things better. So, not dismissing any of these possibilities, but just saying that we need to have a much more balanced conversation on this, okay? So this is uh, what we call the House of AI. This is uh, based on a forthcoming book that my co-author Ravi Bapna and I have written. It's published by MIT. So the first pillar is known as the descriptive pillar. And the question there is simply looking at what happened, okay? So if an organization is about to adopt an AI journey, the question to answer is what happened based on a certain data set that you are tapping into. This, as you can see, requires very basic data science skills. It doesn't require any significant modeling skills. It requires what we call exploratory analysis, descriptive statistics, you know, visualization, if you like dashboards, that sort of thing. Okay? So here is, for example, an example of a customer. You see the red dot. That customer is in front of the Samsung store. It's a cell phone store, as you all know. From Samsung store, they go to the Google Pixel store downstairs. From Google Pixel store, they go to you know, a Huawei store. From Huawei, they go to another, let's say, you know, Blackberry, I'll be kind. Um, and finally, they come to the Apple store. Okay? So if Apple is trying to figure out what that customer in the white shirt and black slacks is interested in, by knowing that in the immediate preceding 20 minutes, this customer went to five competing smartphone manufacturing stores, gives them a pretty good idea of the fact that this guy might be interested in an Apple product, okay? Because he just went to Samsung, Google, Huawei, Blackberry, and Apple. The second pillar is prediction. And the question is, what will happen next? Okay, which is a very different question from the first pillar. The first pillar was what has happened so far? Prediction is looking forward in the future. Now, if you want to make your organization you know, AI-driven based on the second pillar, you need people with expertise in predictive analytics, okay? which means like forecasting, machine learning, data mining. Okay? And most good universities already have courses in them. So the good news is we are, in fact, slowly and steadily producing uh, you know, a great crop of next generation of employees who have these skills. The third pillar is, in my opinion now, we are getting into some really hot stuff, which is causal inference, okay? So prediction has been around for a long time, and a lot of companies, and I would say many people in, on the planet can do prediction pretty well. But causal inference, I'd say, is notoriously difficult, but it's also incredibly important. And in the House of AI, in, in sort of the book that we've written, we have emphasized that the next generation of companies, the one who will win 
the battle in this decade and maybe the next decade. It's hard to predict beyond a few years in the world of AI. But I'll tell you comfortably that the battle between 2023 and 2030, the next five to seven years, those companies who invest in people who understand causal inference are going to take that cake. Okay? So what is the question here? The question here is now very different. Okay? It's not what happened, what will happen next. The question is, did X cause Y? Okay? Did you buy the product before, because I send you a price promotion? Maybe the answer is no, because you would have bought the product anyway. Okay? So there are many, many examples of causal analytics that are important, but the most important thing to keep in mind is, you know, as organizations, if you don't understand why consumers are responding in a certain way to a certain intervention, you can't scale it up. You can run small pilots, but if you don't understand why people are behaving in a certain way, you won't be able to scale it up, right? And that's why this is important. And then the last pillar, I would say, is what I call prescriptive. Okay, so now we are essentially, uh, let's say, wrapping up the whole house of AI idea. The question now is also different. The question is, how should we respond? Okay, now contrast that with the very first question. The first question is, what happened? The second pillar was, what will happen next? The third pillar was, why did it happen? And the last pillar is, what should we now do? Okay, how should we respond? So this requires uh, organizations to have people with expertise in a different set of skill sets, such as optimization. Okay? The reason this is important is because you can only answer this question by understanding how consumers behave when they have constraints. We all have constraints. We have time constraints, we have monetary constraints, we have cognitive constraints, all kinds of constraints, right? So similarly, organizations also have constraints, right? Most organizations, if not all, will say, you know, this is our fixed budget. We can't move beyond that. Maybe 5%, maybe a little bit, but not beyond that. So as a decision maker, you're operating out of some constraints, which means you need to have people you know, who can actually uh, understand optimization. Optimization means essentially working under constraints. Okay? So coming back to remember I told you about the four limitations. All human beings have four limitations. Now I'm going to tie back those limitations to this pillar. The first limitation was multidimensional thinking. We can't do multidimensional exploration, but machines can do this really well. The second a limitation was explicitating, ta explicitating tacit knowledge, right? What information exists here, but we're not able to articulate, you know, irrespective of education or IQ. Well, that's exactly what predictive algorithms do. They use rule-based system to be able to predict what's going to happen next, okay? It's hard as human beings for us. Even if you put 100 people together, it's not going to work as well as machines do that, okay? The third limitation was counterfactual thinking. Okay, so again, the idea of what would the world look like if a certain set of events didn't happen, right? How would you actually navigate? It's, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, for us to actually think through that. We can maybe wish for it, we can visualize it, but you know, uh, the question here is different. Can you actually assess how consumers would behave in a counterfactual world, okay? This is where, again, we have, as humans, we have limitations, but machines are really, really good at this stuff, uh, sometimes in combination with us, sometimes alone, but they are pretty good at this. So this is the third pillar that I'm advocating is important for an AI organization. And the fourth one is prescriptive, and the, and the limitation here is, again, we have limitations in combinatorial thinking, okay? Uh, whether you put five people together, one or 100, it'll still not do this job as well as a set of algorithms trained to do this optimization. So the point is, you know, I, th I think we, we have to recognize that A, irrespective of the organization, small, medium, or large, and irrespective of the number of people you have, um, there are some limitations that human beings we're not able to address, okay? And this is exactly the space that algorithms and machines now have an opportunity to tap into, okay? They're not taking things away from us, but rather they are complementing us. And I want to emphasize the fact that, you know, complementing human and machine intelligence is a very different story than substituting human intelligence with machine intelligence. 
So lastly, if you go up, right, all of this is nice and dandy, but remember, we still have to take care of a few things. You know, what kind of people do you actually have to hire in the top layer? People who can excel in storytelling, you know, taking the insights and applying judgment. And you'll see uh, later on, I'll talk about this. Machines are very good at prediction, but they're not very good at judgment, at least not yet. Human beings are a lot better at judgment, uh, but we're not as good at, at prediction. And so that's where the complementary comes in.